Do they no, both work? Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. Shall we get started? Welcome, everyone, to this uh, breakout session on regenerative medicines. Um, first, maybe to introduce ourselves. My name is Barbara Treutlein. I'm professor at ETH Zurich in Switzerland. And I'm Henry Jasper. I'm a principal scientist in immunology discovery at Genentech, research and development, working on regeneration and regenerative medicine more broadly. Yes, and so my lab is, is using organoids a lot and, and also studying regeneration in, in highly regenerative species. Um, yes, let's get started. So Yeah, so we figured we, we'll start with uh, a few slides to set the stage um, and then obviously open up the discussion. Um, very generally, when, you know, we, we were asked to, to do a breakout session on regenerative medicine, so we figured it might be useful to um, establish what the goals for regenerative medicine are specifically. Um, and obviously, in the context of the Human Cell Atlas, an obvious question that emerges from any study on regeneration is that we need to understand really what the cellular trajectories are, both during a regenerative episode, let's say after injury, but also more broadly during development homeostasis, regeneration, and ultimately aging, right, if you look at the overall trajectory of, of a lifespan of an organism. Um, to do that, we of course need to understand in more detail how stem cells actually influence and control regenerative processes, how they are regulated themselves, how they interact with the tissue microenvironment, and how they influence the tissue function. And ultimately, we need to have a, a clear if you want atlas of how tissue repair occurs in space and time. Um, a lot of work has been done in model systems, and we'll get through this briefly today. Um, but of course, as you know, also organoid systems are being used quite broadly right now to model regenerative processes, to study them in the lab, and potentially to actually develop cell therapies and organoid therapies for tissue repair in the clinic. Um, there is therapeutically, when you think about regenerative medicine, there are ultimately two ways of doing this. One is to, maybe three ways. One is to perturb stem cell function in vivo using traditional small molecule, large molecule approaches and improve their function, improve regeneration. The other is to use gene therapy to induce in vivo reprogramming if we want to establish new cell types that are not endogenously being re regenerated. Um, and finally, of course, there's cell therapy. So basically, can we, we, we need to construct cells and organ systems that we could ultimately transplant back into the patient. Um, in all of these strategies, there is a need for a detailed characterization understanding of um, the cell composition, cellular identities, cellular changes where single cell approaches are, of course, going to be significantly helpful. Please go ahead. And um, there are a lot of questions, open questions, that would be excited, exciting to discuss. And so one is, of course, how far have we come in establishing a regeneration atlas in individual tissues where we can map uh, cell population and identity changes in time and space? How, how good are we actually covering uh, temporal uh, reconstruction of these processes, especially in humans, and what have we learned from those? And um, can we actually use atlases of healthy and diseased uh, tissue states to guide regenerative therapies? Another question is whether these cell atlases that we are generating and have been is establishing whether they help us define stable tissue states that actually serve as targets for regenerative medicine, and uh, whether we can then use these targets to induce endogenous regeneration, or are actually such states intrinsically unstable and dynamic, uh, and we, we might not find them in, in the um, unperturbed atlas, let's say. Um, then, how does um, cellular plasticity impact regenerative processes? Are most of the repair processes uh, a consequence of rigid cell lineages, or are lineage relationships themselves very plastic? Um, another question is whether we can translate findings from highly regenerative species to humans, and what, the role, uh, uh, hu what role human organoids are actually playing 
um, in, in the development of future regenerative therapies. And so we just want to give a, a few kind of vignettes uh, to get your mind going in this, uh, in this area. And of course, you all saw the talk by Priska Liberali, and, and she showed very nicely that organoids can be used to actually model regenerative processes, and that you can actually use then these organoids to screen uh, compounds that might actually facilitate and, 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 um, pro, uh, and, and push regeneration and then potentially one can use that and, and bring it uh, to the in vivo context. I'm not showing this here, so these are adult stem cell derived organoids, but also um, pluripotent and, and, and embryonic stem cell derived organoids that model development can be used to actually generate tissues in vitro and potentially one could use these tissues actually in the future for transplantation, uh, which is of course another aspect of regenerative medicine. And then there are really regeneration champions, um, such as planaria or axolotls, that really can regenerate major parts of their, their body, including a whole limb, the whole body in planaria, or limbs, brains, and so on. So what can we learn from these species? And um, we have already seen that actually, for example, for the axolotl in the limb, the cells are actually de-differentiating to a stem cell, de to a stem cell state in order to re-differentiate. So how can we maybe induce such de-differentiation in humans um, to, to uh, repair um, injured tissues? Um, or in the case of the brain, actually we see that there are adult stem cells that then can give rise to new tissues upon uh, brain um, injury. And so there are a number of examples in the literature um, that suggest that understanding um, really these regenerating organisms will help us inform approaches for regenerative medicine as well. And this is just one example of, from Seth Blackshaw's lab where he's done a comparative study, multiomic analysis of retinal regeneration in fish, in, 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 fish, in chicken, and in uh, mouse trying to understand why the fish and the bird retina does regenerate while the mouse or mammalian retina more generally does not, right? Um, and really using these multiomic approaches allowed them to pinpoint regulatory nodes that are active in these lower vertebrates but are inactive in the mouse and obviously allowing us to establish what the targets are that we may need to engage in order to allow the mammalian retina to regenerate as well. So it's just one example where comparative approaches can be very powerful to pinpoint um, targets for regenerative medicine in potentially humans as well. Um, other things that are being explored and where, where really single cell and multiomic approaches are becoming more and more relevant are questions about um, cell lineage changes and in vivo reprogramming or reprogramming more generally. Um, I'm highlighting here a paper by Jacob Kimmel, Jacob Kimmel in, uh, at Calico. Uh, it's actually preprint for now, where they've looked at partial reprogramming of cells using the Yamanaka factors, um, trying to understand where there is a switch between the initial epigenetic reprogramming rejuvenation of cells to pluripotency overall. And obviously, single cell approaches will allow us to really establish what the trajectories are of these cells and understand more specifically what the initial uh, epigenetic changes are that are being elicited in order to then get to a particular substate, right? To a rejuvenated state, to a repaired state before it goes all the way to pluripotency. And then um, when you think further into therapeutic approaches, and here I'm highlighting uh, again a preprint by uh, Frederick Lana's lab where um, they've been looking at iPS cell derived retinal pigment epithelial cells and really explored the overall trajectory of differentiation of these cells in culture, but cells that are that will actually be used for therapeutic approaches, right? So retinal pigment epithelial cells happen to be one of the first cell therapies for regeneration on the, or in the clinic. Um, and to establish the production process, the GMP production process that allows you to go into the clinic, again, single cell approaches are going to be very powerful 
to benchmark the quality of these cells, to benchmark the establishment of the right cell state, and to understand overall how your production process is actually changing cellular trajectories before you get to the final product. Yes, and I, I think now we can actually directly dive into the discussion. We, we just put up a, a few more questions. This is all <laughs> a, a lot, but they, that can guide us in the discussion. Um, so these are now a bit more specific. So can we develop a reference atlas across development, maturation, adulthood, and aging? Um, and what will this atlas then tell us um, actually about how um, we can maybe induce regeneration in tissues. Can we establish actually regeneration reference atlases in individual tissues that map cell populations and identity changes in time and space during tissue repair? And of course, this is very limited in humans. We are very limited in, in the time points that we can get um, the tissue that is accessible. Um, so how can maybe organoids fill in there? Um, and how can we then use all this knowledge to actually come up with the next uh, generation uh, regenerative therapies? Um, yeah, how can, inform, uh, how can organoids inform us in, in, this, uh, in this endeavor? And um, how will in vivo reprogram, what role will in vivo reprogramming play? Is this really something that, that, might, that we might use uh, in, in the clinic? Um, and um, yeah, can we use regeneration atlases to define optimal approaches for ex, ex vivo organogenesis for ther cell therapy? I, th I think I just stop here and. and yeah. uh, <laughs> I think we'll, we'll open it up to the audience first to whether there are some comments, questions already. Um, otherwise, I have a first question to start with, maybe. Anyone? Do you want to sit? We'll sit so it's less intimidating. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Do we have a runner? Or? <laughs> we can share this one. Well, I'm, I'm looking at the first bullet point and um, the first question that comes to the mind, and, and thank you so much for uh, your in introduction to this breakout session. My name is Marcel Brissova. I come from Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm interested in uh, pancreas and pancreatic islet development and also strategies for regeneration of pancreatic islets. Um, they are uh, rather senescent cells and um, we think of them as honorary, honorary neurons sitting in the pancreas because the, they um, stop proliferating around age five. Um, in humans, and so just just thinking about the first bullet point here: development, maturation, adulthood, and aging. Ref, uh, atlas across. So, what what are the thoughts about integrating and and synergi synergizing efforts around developmental and pediatric uh, atlas and uh, across these adult um, human uh, cell atlas networks? Uh, do, do you have some thoughts uh, about that? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a, it's a very good question. I think for every organ that we are looking at, uh, we might have a different time frame where the relevant cell state is present and then uh, might uh, disappear over time. So it, it is very important to have really these atlases across all possible um, um, time windows of, of uh, lifespan. And, and so I think there is more and more efforts to also um, get uh, established pediatric atlases. Um, I think we don't have so many of them yet, um, but there, there, I mean, there was a major push uh, also through CCI funding to, to really um, establish pediatric atlases. But just looking forward, you know, once these atlases become established, uh, connecting them to uh, information that is emerging from, you know, studying adult organs and organs in the disease state, I think that will be very uh, important and informative for the Yes, community. yes. I think currently we really have the early development uh, that is getting covered in adulthood and aging as well, but, but yeah, the, the pediat pediatric samples are, of course, extremely precious and, and much more rare. I um, think a, a, a technical question we have to ask there is, 
do we really understand how sparse our temporal information can be while still being able to infer trajectories, lineages, etc. And I'm not sure we have a good answer for that at this point, right? But it's certainly something we probably need to develop um, in the lab, try to establish what, how, if you just take, for example, this trajectory for retinal pigment epithelial cells, which is a fully in vitro differentiation process, right? And you can take different time points easily, analyze them. I think this could be a good paradigm, for example, to establish, well, for this overall differentiation trajectory and the temporal changes there, what are the, what, what is the, 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 the smallest possible data set you can generate in order to still be able to infer uh, lineage relationships, et cetera. Right? And of course, we've heard yesterday and two days ago a lot about already about lineage tracing approaches and so on. All of these approaches are going to be very powerful to try and really establish these kind of questions. Because ultimately, the, the limitation we have for humans is always the accessibility of samples, right? And we'll, we'll have to find a way to work with, with limited data sets. And I think there actually, um, it, Again, organoids can fit very nicely in to see actually what is the state landscape and how plastic is it? What does a, a certain cell type of interest do in, in, in a perturbation scenario? How far will it move away from, from its kind of ground state? And that would maybe show also how maybe plastic and how dynamic it is also um, in vivo, where constantly there are new inputs coming um, and yeah, so that, that would I mean, define the, the time course. What is the time, temporal resolution we need? Um, right. Definitely. But I, I mean, we can also pivot into a discussion on the usefulness of organoids <laughs> to, to, to use for regenerative medicine. And I think a, an important question that is still remains there, and obviously everybody acknowledges this, is complexities, right? Is in a, an intestinal organoid system right now, we have epithelial cells basically acting on their own and they don't do that in vivo. And so how can we establish systems in which we at least try to model the microenvironmental complexity that is actually controlling stem cell activity as well? Um, and ultimately, a lot of the, if, if we start establishing organoids from patient populations, and we try to understand what is actually the, uh, the driver of the pathology we're trying to model, um, often we won't see anything if we just look at, look at epithelial cells, right? So, so how can we establish high throughput methods to, that are complex enough that allow us to actually uh, address questions like that? And, and, and again, it's, it's early, early in, in the game, and so we'll eventually be able to do that. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I think that's a great um, point, and, and this is exactly what I was thinking um, as well, is because in the organoids, um, you know, we obviously mainly have a single lineage, although there are quite complex systems from that are even that are IPS derived nowadays. Um, whereas in the human cell atlas, we obviously have the whole tissue microenvironment, the whole niche, and even actually, you know, uh, distal signaling input and so on to tissues. And um, I mean, you showed uh, so so. There, there are obviously two ways of mimicking that in the dish. One is sort of purely biochemical, where you're basically trying to mimic the microenvironment by adding factors, you know, having the same mechanical kind of context and so on. But the other one is, you know, what you showed was um, the cell combinations and sort of co-culture systems and so on. So I guess, you know, my question is how, how far can we go in, in, in sort of achieving that complexity and, and actually, is that useful, or is a more reductionist approach kind of uh, actually more useful for mechanistic insights? I mean, what are, what are people's views on that? Hi, Sarah. I think, <clears throat> I, I personally think that a reductionist approach at this stage might be better, and I talk about probably my field, and maybe this applies for many others. So yes, add factors and try, rather than try to do co-cultures and mix up too many cells. The reason I say this is that we have a complexity that we haven't yet mentioned, and it was kind of implied. I give you the example of the cardiomyocytes. 
our level of differentiation of the cardiomyocytes, first of all, from IPS is not brilliant. Can we differentiate a little bit in ventricular atrial? Mm -mm. But how are we going to mimic all the new cardiomyocytes cell states that we have identified? So if we can get one kind of ventricular cardiomyocyte, but I, I, we haven't yet done a, a close comparison of the cardiomyocytes in vivo with what you get in vitro. But that is a big problem for me because I can use it as a screen, and I will, but I know well that it's not perfect. It's far, far, it's less perfect than I thought before. Before I thought it was not very mature cardiomyocyte, and now I, it's like... And so I, I would have a question there when it comes to getting, let's say, identifying a molecule that can drive your cardiomyocytes to a particular substate, right? Um, do we believe that the trajectory that a cell and culture would actually undergo to get to that final state resembles what actually happens in vivo, right? And, and obviously we can't answer that at this point, but, but that could become an issue, right, where you have continuous interactions between the mesenchyme and the, the myocytes Absolutely. or whatever, yeah. which are dynamic and ultimately will be very different from what we experience in culture, right? Aviv had a question. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a, I just basically hogged the microphone. So I actually do think that we can end up building very complex, I mean, you know, what we're able to do and how fast we're progressing is awesome. I, I actually am really enjoying, you know, even looking at the simple organoids against the in vivo data and, you know, like ideally in a match system, like the same patient and you really see what cell intrinsic and what cell extrinsic and, because I think that the microenvironment is multimodal in its action. It, it doesn't, I mean, it's, it's fun to do one at a time. I, I like throwing in an entire cell type because actually even one cell type is often not one factor. If we saw Elaine's talk yesterday, yes, we managed to piece apart that there's this one really super dominating uh, factor that certainly in, in vitro could recapitulate most of it. But there were five factors that likely play a role. So I, I actually like throwing in entire cell types into the cold culture. And then, you know, you could also, and, and I'm hoping, you know, that we will be able to build increasingly complex organoids. And, and it's always nice to have that in vitro comparison. So you're building it up one block at a time so you could really dissect it. Uh, but on the other hand, increasing complexity of what you can do in vitro with perturbations, with linear uh, lineage tracing, with all the fun stuff, with all the scale and, and, and rapidness. So that's, that's going to be a, a fun toggle. Yeah. So first to Henry's question was, would it have to recapitulate the progression to hit into the same state? I think it depends on how you're actually treating the um, engineered regeneration compared to the native one. One path would be the kind that actually does recapitulate because you're doing it through the same means in the same subtlety that it happens in the tissue. And the other, which is what usually happens in the programming, is that you come with a big hammer, like the overexpression of a couple of things to extreme non-physiological levels and you just get there. And in the just get there, from what we can extrapolate from what we've seen in other systems, it's not recapitulating development. No. It's just doing something different to get to the same state because you're allowing it to do things that don't happen in, in natural development and that wouldn't be compatible even with natural development. They would actually be a hot mess in natural development because in natural development, you actually have to generate a lot of many, many, many different things in parallel in the right proportions and so on. Here you don't need it. So as, if you take that reprogramming route, I see no reason it should, it should follow. In fact, I see many, many reasons why it won't. The other point to, um, to the earlier point of the, you know, but it's not the cells that we want, it's kind of one of these problems where you just triangulate in, by doing many, many different types of approaches. You need the in vivo approach because only there you have all of them. You need, the, you need the very dissected approach because, in fact, even if you could build an organoid with all the components, you would then be in the same problem you are in vivo where when you pull on one thing, it's very hard to know what's happening to all the others. So it's nice to reduce to just two players, even if you know that there's, in reality, five. It's just convenient uh, from... Yeah, 
And at the same time, you use the back and forth between the in vivo and the ex vivo or in vitro in order to in order to make the model better and better. Make progress. It's just that's that's what it's going to be like, practically speaking. There's no way of cutting that corner. Yeah, it's it's just that fun. you now know that you have been cutting corners. Basically, that's what you yeah. told us. That's kind of it's it's a little bit of a bummer when you figure it out, yeah. but then it's also a great opportunity. I, so I, I, I think it depends a little bit on your goal, right? If you if, if you're talking about actually generating a cell type for transplantation and cell therapy, how you get to that cell type, as long as it is the same cell type, I think is not that important. The, the question, though, is if you use organoid systems to understand a regenerative process and to understand the subtleties that might happen in vivo, that's where you need more complexity. That's when you, the, that's when you actually want to recapitulate right. the process rather than just the input. Exactly. Two different things. Exactly. Yeah. So again, I'm not an expert in regenerative medicine. I'm, a, you know, um, basically a, an intruder here. But, you know, if you're actually planning on putting something in a body, does it, I mean, you know, especially if, again, going back to Elaine's talk where there's so much epigenetic memory of where a cell has been, which I think might influence its plasticity of what it could do it in its future. So you say, okay, this cell type now looks okay, but encoded in it based on its epigenetic history might be the potential to do things you might not want it to do in a real body should it, you know, encounter a, 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 a weird scenario. So. It's Again, I'm not a, no MD or no, anything, no, I'm, but, but I think it might matter how it got there in terms of what it can do in the future. It's a, yes. it's, it's a critical question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think actually, and in, we, we need additional tools to actually assess how similar they are. I mean, transcriptomics, epigenomics. how it, the plasticity of, and, and it reached this new cell type, but not only is its current transcriptional state identity, but, but it, its potential landscape. and responsive yeah. to stimuli identical as yes, well. Yes, yes. That is the test. But, um, yeah, yeah. So, so in, in a way, you, one would need to generate this perturbation landscape for the, for the engineered and for the, for the primary cell, and this respond would, uh, response would need to be the same. And I think also in the subcellular structure of the cell and so on, I mean, I think we need to use a lot of additional single cell and single molecule tools to really assess how similar cells are and, and look at perturbations, yeah. I think, Barbara, the question to that would be how much of it you can phenotype, basically define the phenotypes that define that history, versus how much of it you have to actually intervene in the cell and see how it responds. So how much you can do just with phenotyping and how much of it you have to do kind of in a more functional way. And we have no idea. Yeah, and honest. I think what are the modalities yeah. that, well, that are the, what are the, the most important modalities to define? Yeah, and many of them would not is it a be redundant, is it a, right? That we think yeah. of as two radically different things and would end up being the same. But there is a flip side to this. In this, we kind of think of the cell as kind of the main agent. But once you take a cell, even with a very particular state and very particular behavior and all of its histories, and you stick it in an, a tissue context, the tissue can overtake the cell rather than the cell overtaking the tissue. You kind of want your cell basically to then reprogram the tissue and give the tissue the right characteristics and heal it and so on. But nothing prohibits you from ending up in the opposite situation where the tissue, which is a very mighty force filled with cells and molecules and so on, basically takes control over the cell that you brought in. There's a there's a practical point I wanted to make, but I'll get back to this. There's a question over here. Uh, Jen from Mass General Hospital, uh, Harvard Medical School. So I think you're following up on many of the uh, other people's opinions. So um, in terms of the organ or in vitro organoid systems, uh, there's a large variety of you know, experts in the stem cell field. They're trying to do in vivo modeling, so cross-species chimeras. So and if you're thinking about environment, but um, I think that's might be somehow missing here. Uh, Organo is great, but it's in vitro system. But there are a lot of people are trying to put those stem cells into mice or any animals. You're, you're talking so, human cells? Yes, yeah. like cross species chimeras yeah. to model regeneration. Mm -hmm. So I think if we're talking about what is the better model, but uh, I think there's a there's a another. Uh, yeah. uh, huge field that, that we didn't cover here in terms of uh, yeah, regeneration. A bit, a bit flippantly, you could argue that you're using the mouse or the rodent as a test tube for your human cells at that point, right? But yeah, I, be, there, basically you're, you're introducing a lot of the complexity that you're missing. 
but like uh, at least lots of evidence suggested that, that the cells are more functional mature if you yeah. put it into like a real host environment. Right. I, 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 yeah, I did want to come back to the one point here though, practically speaking, when it comes to transplanting a cell type, obviously ideally you want to have the developmental history that that cell might have had in the patient, him or herself, um, but obviously we have a whole branch of medicine where transplantations are being done continuously with no regard to that, right? And so, so practically speaking, if we let's go back to the example of RPE cells, the general approach has been so far to basically make a cell type that looks like an RPE cell based on three or four markers of genes. And so, so, so you apply, and, and then you transplant them, and they're in the clinic, right? And it works. And, um, and now we have, with, with all the single cell technology coming up, we'll have a much better understanding for what these cells are and how to optimize the process. So the, the future is gonna be great there, and we're, we're going to be able to adjust the approach to make them even more successful, right? Um, but practically speaking, you can rely on a subset of markers already um, to, to, to gain some benefit for patients, which is ultimately what we're looking for, right? Um, so we shouldn't, we shouldn't overthink it either. Uh, but of course, the more we know, the better. At this point. But I, actually here I have, I have another example where uh, it can also be the other way that, that you assume you have clean populations that you transplant and you just start by transplanting into mouse. For example, for vascular systems, you have parasites and endothelial cells, you transplant them and suddenly you, you get from these human cells a lot of bone related tissue. You get, and, and so you realize actually that the parasites, these mural cells are actually quite plastic and they can revert to more mesenchymal stem cell-like uh, states and, and then form all kinds of mesodermal lineages. So, yeah, I think well, it, it really depends on the context and, and on the Absolutely. tissue. And, and, for, and I think for safety, it's going to be critical. Their safety, yeah. it, exactly. It will be extremely critical because a, a tiny population of, of less differentiated cells in, in a preparation will <laughs> go wild after transplantation pretty much and, and that, yeah, so one needs to avoid and we can't do a quality control with like sorting for, for three right. uh, antibodies or something. Right. So it, it's clear that there's way more heterogeneity and plasticity that needs to be considered. Just just one, one thought. Um, I think, you know, we kind of have to think about what the end goal is. Are we gonna regenerate the cells from endogenous source or is this gonna be cell replacement therapy? So for example, in the area of type one diabetes, you know, the um, a strategy is kind of been uh, followed in parallel. Can we regenerate endogenous beta cells? for example, stimulating their proliferation, or are we gonna generate beta cells de novo from embryonic stem cells? And you know, over past decade, um, people have been able to generate beta-like cells from uh, uh, human ES cells, and actually FDA approved a trial to transplant these uh, ES cell-derived beta-like cells into individuals with um, with type 1 diabetes associated with hypoglycemia and awareness. And so I, I feel like if, if we could follow the processes in parallel, understand what goes in terms of um, a regenerative process in vivo, in, uh, in, in primary human tissue, and understand these processes as we are generating cells de novo from embryonic stem cells and and figure out uh, critical points that uh, um, define allocation of cells into certain cell types. I think that's gonna be really important for the field to understand how to, how to navigate cell differentiation, but also regeneration from existing cells in, in human body. Yeah, yeah no, I think there's no question that these new approaches are going to revolutionize how we develop regenerative medicines, right? And, and because that's what these approaches are for, right? To understand cell complexities, population complexities, et cetera. Um, one question I would have is do, whether we all believe that the technology right now 
is mature enough to serve as a benchmark for, for the clinic. By, by which I mean, do we understand that our approaches are vetted and robust enough that we can say, okay, with definitive, with a definitive statement, say, okay, this population, based on my single cell analysis, be it a multi home analysis or any seq analysis, is definitively that population? Or do we need to do much more work to make sure that the procedures and the analysis pipelines and everything are robust enough to be used for the clinic? Because we need to benchmark these things, right? It's not, it's not as simple as in the lab. Uh, we put the population together, we have a nice graph, and we put it in a paper, right? I mean. So, so I think that, that the technologies are there, the experimentalists have it down, and it's we, the computational people, that are lacking. And, and there's a, a fundamental thing which I think we haven't solved. I've been complaining about it since 2016. And guilty as charged, I can't convince any of my students or postdocs to engage with it, even though Graham did the first good step. And it's, I don't think we've fundamentally defined a good definition or metric of cell similarity. When is it similar? We know that the in vitro is different than the in vivo, that's clear. I mean, if you just look at pure mathematical, all molecules are created equal, similarity, they, they are different because they are in a different environment. And so to, you know, give a biologic, and then we have all our mutually nearest neighbors and this is sort of okay and we, you know, get by and we do biology and we learn new stuff and we're satisfied and don't push ourselves. But I think fundamentally, the field, and this is on us, is missing a biologically meaningful uh, similarity metric, and that I think is critical to make this a faithful process. Yeah, ultimately we have to transition from hypothesis generation, which is great, to definitive answers in the clinic. You can't have a hypothesis in the clinic if you go in and, and transplant cells in there. So you want to know what you're doing. Yeah, so, so again, what, what, what matters? What, can, can we define a quantifiable, you know, computable similarity metric mm -hmm. that's biologically faithful. Oh, more questions. I think we go back a little bit to the point that Barbara made before, however. You can have in vitro the best cell, and then you don't know what happens when you put it in vivo. So I think that, yes, you can get as close as you can and have your own parameters, and it might be the five markers, might be good enough as a more in-depth gym module, but I think ultimately it's when you put it in, in vivo, so, and it's gonna be so different for many different organs and, and systems that it's, it's hard to standardize, I think. So I, yeah, I, th I think I fully agree, uh, and uh, I fully agree with Dana also that, I mean, we, we calculate similarities, we can say it's 95% similar or something, but it will be really important to identify or to annotate actually, I mean, we have gene ontology and so on, but, but really to learn now from all the data across organs, across cell types, what are really core modules and which ones are you know, maybe just defining rough spatial location in the tissue because of some gradient you have in morphogens or in, in, in metabolic signal or something, but what are really the core, uh, the, the core modules that define identity, and that identity can shift around. And so this shifting around will then be changes in these other modules that are not so important for that identity. And really, I guess from all the data we have, including spatial and all the modalities in single cell, and, and uh, yeah, one, one should be able maybe to learn that. Um, yeah. Of course, um, I mean, the, the machine yeah. taking all this data should be able to learn it, but one needs to, to come get, up with the approaches to, to get of there. Of course, we're much, yeah, yeah. we have many more information to get more and more precise, but... Uh, but that will yeah, be exciting yeah. once we are there. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> That's one of the goals, no? Yes, the final take is what happens. And also a follow-up uh, note. Um, do we have the right technologies to characterize the similarities of cell that you put into the human? I'm not sure, I love single cell. So I'm not sure the single cell sequencing is actually the answer for that because 
you, you probably wanted to have some label-free, non-destructive ways to measure the similarities. So you can actually put the same cells back to the patient versus you measure another cell, you kill the cell, and do the profiling. But you actually didn't quantify or characterize the cells you we actually wanted to put into a, a patient. So I feel like to, 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 to characterize the cells uh, the similarities, maybe more label-free methods, non-destructive methods, might be a, a better way so that you can actually measure the same cells that you're going to transplant. Yeah, it, it depends on what cells you're working with, I guess. If you have a large enough population of an IPS-derived cell type you want to put into the patient, you can, of course, sample that, right? And you can basically take samples, assuming that you have a representative sample, single cell is going to inform you quite a lot. Um, but the, 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 the plasticity of the cells you're going to implant are, is going to be a big deal, right? And, and actually, in this one study I, I highlighted for, for RPE cells again, they indeed took these cells, put them into rabbits after their differentiation process, and then isolated them again and did single cell on the implanted cells. And evidently, there was an, a, a massive maturation process going on in vivo in the retina of the, of the, of the rabbit um, that allowed these cells to become more similar even to m adult mature RPE cells. Yeah. So it is then the microenvironment that actually guides these cells into the right fate. Can we always expect that to happen? I don't think so. <laughs> but it's just... Right. Is it... Go ahead, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, in the um, uh, mesenchymal sort of cell therapy for um, so articular chondrocyte, you know, knee surgery, uh, which is a cell therapy that's approved at least in the UK. I don't know, maybe in other countries too. The, their their cells are first taken from adipocytes from the patient in one general anesthetic kind of extraction, and then in a second general anesthetic, they're put into the knee, like into the the injury, and then you know, who knows what happens basically, but it, it's, so we are thinking here in a very precise, very genomic, very quantitative computational way, right? But some of these therapies, I mean, it's, it's approved and it obviously is better than the standard of care because otherwise it wouldn't be, you know, an approved thing, but it's, uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I have some strong <laughs> opinions on this, right? Because an M MSC therapy is not a cell therapy in, in the regenerative context. It is a therapy with cells that are immune modulatory. Right, and they For are sure, but I'm using it as an example know, yeah, of yeah. how little precision. That's right. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. And 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 in that case, certainly, also the analogy to what you were saying is that the microenvironment is instructing the cells, then obviously to, right. to contribute to yeah. cartilage, that blah blah repair. So I have another question, which is on human genetic variation. So we, when we discuss it, we're like, oh, we'll find like the best recipe. We'll get the thing, maybe following the natural or not. But of course, there is this huge set of uh, varying loci in the cells of different people that are all potential modifiers of whatever it is that we do. So I wonder how people are thinking of that. Well, on, on, the, on the one hand, we've seen um, Mark given, I think he, he showed some of the approaches they're trying to do to do this village in addition analysis for, and again, RPE differentiation. But, um, <laughs> Where, where it's really, the question is, do variants that are associated with AMD, do they influence the cell type in vitro, right? Um, and I think that, that, is, that is a good approach and can be used definitely to characterize the cells themselves. What we cannot yet do is really predict how the host's genetic variability is going to influence your cell therapy. And I think that's going to require a lot more work and, and, and this is probably going to be a long-term goal, right? Uh, because in order to predict which patients would benefit the best from your cell therapy, you ideally would want to know this, right? Um, but that's going to require some uh, significant advances. And maybe that's where an advance in organoid systems that include a niche, include complexity, that you can then perturb genetically would be very, very powerful. And maybe there are certain contexts in which one can try that where maybe two or three cell types make the niche um, and, and where can, which one could use as an experimental approach first, right? I think actually, I mean, uh, yeah, genetic variability is, uh, or variation is one important aspect. I think when working really with 
stem, uh, with pluripotent stem cell derived cells and tissues that are engineered in vitro, one other aspect is really that one IPS line is not equal to another IPS line. So this is even starting, and, and we haven't yet fully understood why are they different and why are they different in their response to a differentiation protocol that is very strongly controlled. And um, so I think we actually need to start there in order to bring that to the clinic and make sure every patient would then get the same cells transplanted. Because currently, sure, we can guide the cells with a very detailed protocol, lots of morphogens, small molecules to, to make sure um, we, we get roughly the same outcome, but it's usually not exactly the same. And I think there's a lot in the ground state of, the, of these pluripotent stem cells where they have different levels of certain signaling pathways already present. And whether that's, it's likely due to the difference in the epigenetics and, and that is not fully being rewritten during the reprogramming and so on. So I think, um, even there, we need to start to really find out what is the best input cell and, and how to define what is the best state and, and what, what are our measurements we need to do to, to do the quality control in that case. Um, and I think it, it, that is even less dependent on the, on the SNPs that the individuals have. It, it is more dependent on, on the reprogramming process that um, they go through. Hi, so my name is Fidel Ramirez. I come from uh, Böhringer, Ingelheim, so very interested, of course, in regeneration. And I want to reflect in the first two questions, right? Can we develop a, a reference atlas and how it should look like? Several people have, yesterday keynote was a good, uh, let's say, example of two things that matter, context that have been mentioned here, and epigenetics. <clears throat> and if we think about the regeneration and, develop, and development, this all, all process driven by epigenetic changes. So I want to pose here to, to this audience, right? Now we have the technology, context is difficult, but at least epigenetics is becoming uh, easier and easier with multimodal uh, uh, techniques, right? So I think such atlas needs to have epigenetics into account, needs to have uh, a taxic at least to identify open chromatin, because this is, you know, this will allow us to identify maybe transcription factors that are binding, that are creating, that are uh, driving the expression that we see afterwards. But, you know, again, to reflect on this, and I think uh, it is really important for Pacifica, this atlas, that epigenetics uh, changes are taken into account, and that will make it even more useful. The context is more difficult because this is very specific for each case, but I think this one will uh, take us a long way. Yes, I fully agree, and, and I think, I mean, there are even other modalities that are, um, such as protein measurements, really understanding the proteins that are there, that would be very important also for this kind of profiling of differentiation, um, because current, I mean, with, with transcriptomics and, and, and epigenomics, we, we understand the regulation um, early on, but what is actually the proteins that are at the end around, um, because they're, of course, their half-life can be very different and, and um, they can be modified, we all know that. So uh, actually, RNA is a good uh, um, proxy for protein, but at the end, um, it, and, and of course, methods are coming out to really do single cell protein profiling. And I think that will be extremely important also in that context to see what, what is a cell actually and, and what, what one, can it do. I would say one technical question there would, would emerge on if we're already th saying that we need a very detailed temporal progression of samples for, to understand transcriptomics and epigenomics, if you add protein to that, I, I, would, I would assume the dynamics of protein composition is going to be much faster than transcriptome and epigenome. And so your, your time points that you need to sample are going to be <laughs> even higher, right? So it, it, gets, it gets really into the question of how, again, Actually, How sparse I don't, can I the don't data necessarily be? think. I think we see transcription go down, and it might be you have that protein around for much longer. And it's still controlling. Um, so, so assuming, uh, yeah, I, I don't Depends know. Depends on the half-life, obviously. obviously yeah, but. I, I, just, I just want to say that there's a really crucial point in this, in the, you know, uh, I, not on the epigenetic side, that's a slightly different question, but on the RNA and the protein, first of all, in the cell, there's at least a 12-hour lag between the big change you see in an RNA and the protein. So looking in the same cell for the two things and expecting them to relate is, is just, it doesn't make any sense, right, up front. 
But irrespective of that, there's a difference between thinking about the individual RNA and the individual type, I mean, class of RNA and class of protein and how they relate to each other and what's happening with them and the phenotype of the cell. So you could take a protein profile and an RNA profile and kind of end up with the same phenotype for the cell, how it relates to other cells, what processes are active and so on. And yet the RNAs and the proteins at the level of the individual ones will behave differently for all of those reasons. But in the phenotypic space, they'll be in the same place. And you can take two profiles and actually end with a phenotypic space in different places. And, and, and what is interesting, for example, about the chromatin and the RNA is that irrespective of whether this locus and I connected it to the right gene and it changed the expression or not, if I just look based on chromatin where the cell is and based on RNA where the cell is, they actually are in different places, sometimes and sometimes not. And actually for different subsets of genes or programs, they will be in the same place or not in the same place. That I think is the material one when you're just in the phenotypic. If we are mechanistic and you need to know which ones to go after, then all of a sudden it really, really matters what the individual ones are doing. We tend to kind of combine them together and then our lives get a lot harder, I think, than they uh, necessarily have to be. Sorry, I stole your mic somehow. No, now Sarah wants yeah. to. Yeah. No, I was just going to add basically, so I completely agree that the, you know, the epigenetic layer is, is incredibly, you know, interesting and, and mechanistically informative as, and the protein layer. I think, and, and, and we should, you know, profile to our heart's content. I mean, what I, what I, so my feeling is that if we can, can get enough data that we can learn from, then actually, and I'm not sure if this is what you were saying or not, but, but actually we should be able to, you know, for a given transcriptome, we should be able to predict what the epigenome is and vice versa. So I don't, you know, they're not, I, I doubt they'll be like uncoupled in space. You know, there will be uh, uh, basically a, a sort of imprint of, of the epigenetic status in the transcriptome and equally, you know, for the protein kinetics, the, the transcriptome will hold a lot of information basically about the, the, the post-translational regulation as well. I think in, pr in principle so that's true. The, the, so, 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 so actually the transcriptome is quite a good place to be <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, in that but, sense. But when, you, when you're talking about a very dynamic change in cell states, the epigenome sometimes precedes your transcriptome. Sure, sure, order, sure, right? sure. And yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. exactly. And, and you want to understand that sometimes, depending on what you do. Right. We, we over I mean, I agree <laughs> that in principle question. one can predict, uh, I mean, in principle one would have a lot of information from the transcriptome. I agree, I agree with Sarah. I guess we haven't yet fully yeah, yeah, no. understood how Yeah, to but that's an exciting kind of challenge, yes, you know? Yes, we should be able, yeah. Uh, just, just one comment, uh, chromatin and, and transcriptome. So, so, for example, around um, beta cell, insulin producing uh, cell differentiation. So one, one area that is kind of poorly understood is, for example, allocation of um, individual endocrine cell types. You know, in pancreatic islets, there's five different endocrine cell types and people do not understand how these uh, different lineages are allocated during differentiation. And one of the things that are currently looking into is chromatin architecture and how we can link it to, to the transcript. So I, I feel that um, is also in and for, for perspective of variants and you know how they are uh, distributed in a non-coding um, sequence, un understanding the chromatin architecture and how it relates to the transcript. I think it will be important. And uh, yesterday in a computational session, I was you know wondering you know are we thinking going forward that we would overlay multimodal information, not only transcript but going also to chromatin and understanding spatial relationships. I think that's that would be um, important for this community moving forward. Yes, I, I fully agree. <laughs> so, so maybe I, I, we have talked a lot about how, you know, organoids, uh, engineered cells, hum, engineered human cells and tissues for regenerative therapies. But how about inducing endogenously uh, regeneration? So can we, I, and of course there we have, we have reprogramming on one hand, there is a whole field that in the brain, make neurons from astrocytes. So far, of course, uh, not in humans, but uh, try to do this in, in, in the mouse, for example. And there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of knowledge of what transcription factors would, would um, 
reprogram one cell type into another if, if that missing cell type should be repopulated. But then also, we, we work with model systems, and I, I showed axolotl planaria. So actually, in the axolotl, it, we, we, my lab, together with Eli Tanaka's lab, profiled the uh, regenerating limb, and we identified a lot of genes that come up that are very interesting in the blastema of the limb prior to um, forming the new limb. And recently, we got interested in the brain, and or, or I have always been interested in the brain. So we started to study, study brain regeneration, and actually, we were super excited to see in a regeneration-specific progenitor state, similar, I mean, some of the exact same genes come up as in the limb blastema. So my question is, and, and of course, we, uh, um, Henry talked about uh, cross-species comparisons, so, I mean, we have started to look now into other species, zebrafish, um, planaria, and so on. Are the same genes actually coming up? So, do we believe there is a sort of core regeneration <laughs> module that, that one could actually induce in human cells uh, to induce a, a regenerative state, a plastic state, that then could um, make, for example, uh, connective tissue cells de-differentiate to a developmental state or to make uh, quiescent stem cells in the brain get proliferative again and regenerate the brain tissue and so on. So uh, I'm curious what people think about these two approaches, either inducing a gene module in, in, in a resident cell to, to, to give rise to new cells that are missing or to reprogram one lineage to another in vivo, in, the, in human eventually. So, you know, one of the things, because, you know, we've been talking a lot about organoids uh, that we, we've mentioned a few times is, 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 you know, tissue context. And I think particularly for injury and regeneration, tissue context really matters. I mean, we've seen, like, particularly in regeneration, incredible differences. So you can compare the individual cell types and say this one has this module and this one doesn't have that module and wouldn't it be nice if we can induce this module but I think that if we really want to take you know a model organism uh, that's different and say oh look at what it does at the level of the cell we have to also look at what other cells is this talking how is the spatial architecture different because I think that particularly for regeneration if we want to, you know, uh, act, you know, get some cool stuff happening in in in, in humans, we we really need to understand the tissue context and how that tissue context interacts with all these cool gene modules that are different. So we, I think we have to make a comparison of both individual cells and their environment to to hope to get this to work. I think that's fundamentally true, but at the same time, it, it will again be context dependent, right? The, the example from Seth Blackshaw's lab is focused on the retina, yeah? and, and comparing the fish and the chick with the, the malian retina, the real difference is that the transdifferentiation event that happens in the fish and the chick, which is basically Müller glia transdifferentiated into photoreceptors, that is, has been lost in evolution basically in mammals. And the, the, tissue, the, Im, the injured environment of the retina is very similar. Actually, the, the, the response of mammalian Müller glia to the injury is very similar, transcriptionally even, including the upregulation of cell cycle uh, genes, etc. But then they hit a wall and they don't go actually all the way into photoreceptor. So that's an example where there is a remnant of the response and you can actually tweak it, the, the hypothesis is that you can tweak it by delivering one more transcription. No, no, factor, I agree that sometimes right? it's enough to tweak exactly. the cell intrinsic. I just think that, you know, if we're, we're really going to, you know, push the field forward and say we're going to use these atlases and these technologies in our sort of intellectual world to do this, right. we need to, in any specific case, understand the cell intrinsic and cell Absolutely. extrinsic components to anything we're studying. And I think really, and, and now the spatial technologies are really finally getting better. And so we're at a place where we can also really focus on characterizing the cell in extrinsic elements of this. And I think we have to characterize and at least semi understand both and then understand what's driving it. Sometimes it will be cell intrinsic. Sometimes it will be cell extrinsic. Uh, 
most time it will be both. Right. But we have to understand the contributions of each of these components. Right. But, but to your point, I think the, um, the goal you could define for these type of studies, for, for the profiling of regenerative processes, is to identify exactly these nodes, right? These, this, this cell state or a regulatory network that controls this plastema state or this pluripotent, multipotent state that you have, which, you know, various regenerative systems are getting there and everybody converges on YAP as a driver of this, but, but it is ultimately, you, common themes are emerging from the intestine, from the olfactory epithelium. I don't know about the plastema in axolotl, but probably you'll get there as well. So, so these, I, I think there are some common regulatory systems, transcription factors, et cetera, that may impart plasticity in a wide range of different tissues, which is exactly what we would be looking for, right? Just like Barbara in the previous part said there was the unintended consequence of the minority population that makes bone where you don't want it. Once you get to plasticity, and you mentioned genes like YAP in particular, <laughs> and, um, and you talk about response to injury and healing, then of course the unintended consequence is cancer. So how do we think about that? I, I, I would argue that the, the fear of cancer is a little bit overstated in regenerative medicine because especially when it comes to controlling tissue stem cells because even if you drive them into overdrive and they proliferate like crazy they have not accumulated somatic mutations well, of course if you go they into an had pre -existing yeah, they right. have pre-existing somatic that's mutations right. so, so you have to you have to know that they're not there that's right so you have to profile that carefully and of course, there's always the risk that in an old patient, you will actually activate stem cells in a way that have actually already the mutation, you, you give them a survival advantage. So the risk is going to be there. Um, but if you, the, the main regeneration approach that people are using right now in terms of stimulating, let's say, wind signaling to drive regeneration, which in the intestine, everybody, you know, anybody who works on cancer would tell you, you cannot activate wind signal. But no, but you can activate it if you do it in the right way, in, in the right temporal context, and in a controlled fashion, right? Um, assuming, of course, that you, are, you have a way of being safe about the, the, the mutations have accumulated in the patient over time. I mean, it, that's going to be a continuing conversation between regeneration and cancer, and ultimately um, it's both sides of the coin, right? So that's the, the, the challenge. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a very, I mean, that's, that's a risk that you would have in both scenarios, trying to induce it endogenously and trying to bring in tissues that were engineered. And maybe also here we can learn from axolotl that doesn't really have a, a higher risk of, of cancer in that case. But yeah, I mean, I, I agree that in, in your example of cross-species comparison of the retina, the, the niche in, broadly is the same across the species. So here um, you can really look at, at, at uh, individual genes in a way. And my example was more really across organs, across species. Is there really something very universal? But um, it could then be that different uh, niche factors induced at the end converge at this universal response at the end. So maybe, maybe something like that. But definitely I agree that we need to consider the environment. Um, yeah. yeah. Another thing against cancer, and, and, and indeed, you know, a lot of what I do is actually look at cells with all sorts of lovely things such as KRAS or loss of P53, MYC, and all sorts of other things. And, um, you know, I, I do think that aged individual have, you know, I probably have a ton of these cells in my body right now. Um, that's just life. Um, yeah, but you have a functional immune system that kills them. Right? Yeah, but, but the point is, one of, one of the other things that we can do, and, and, and we're certainly doing this in, in the cancer field, um, really in the context of trying to limit metastasis, is, is how can we limit the, ba the bad plastic route? So again, if we fundamentally understand cell plasticity, We've actually found ways to, 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 you know, preemptively curtail some of these plasticity and, you know, that stuff which is ongoing in cancer could, could feed into regenerative medicine as sort of, you can imagine, okay, these are some, some necessary factors for bad plasticity routes or, mm -hmm. 
you know, bad, bad, bad routes a cell could take. And certainly for metastasis, we're now thinking of, you know, big picture preemptively giving, you know, some, some blockers of this. Yeah, ultimately using the same approach for in vivo reprogramming in the reverse setting, right? You're basically preventing plasticity by in vivo reprogramming as well. And there's a number of studies that are being, that are trying to do this right now. Um, ultimately, it, as you said, it will depend on our full understanding of what plasticity means and how dynamic it is in vivo and how it interacts with the microenvironment. So, I mean, I guess we all agree that more data is gonna be very useful. <laughs> <laughs> these things. More data and better computational and methods. Better computation. They go hand right. in hand. That's right. That's right. More data, you know, without the right computation is, right. is not going to get us very far. No. But it's going to spend a lot of money. <laughs> and, and Jonah will pay for it all. Is he still here? It is, yeah. not, it is not cheap. <laughs> I, I was going to ask you about the axolotl. So there is, there has been a recent study, and I remember where it was published, but. Um, they've actually made an artificial blastema, put it onto Xenopus, and managed to actually grow a limb in Xenopus using a, basically the, the, the compounds that are the secreted factors that are known to be present in the blastema of axolotl, right? And, and that seemed to be quite successful now you might imagine. I mean, it's it's still an amphibian. and it's you know all of these. Yeah, things. actually, I mean, we did a we did a cross species analysis there, comparing axolotl and xenopus. Actually, and xenopus, at least the uh, froglets, have the capacity to grow a blastema, and to regenerate at least part of a uh, uh, kind of. They have this regenerative spike that develops, so some cartilage re uh, develops, but they don't go through the right morphogenesis to undergo, you know, the patterning is not happening to make all the digits and so on. So I, I, so I think in, in that case you actually might have a very similar environment and we saw that why can it not fully, uh, fully undergo morphogenesis again? It's because the, the, uh, the blastema cells are not going far enough back, de -different, they don't de-differentiate far enough. So I imagine that if you put an axolotl blastema um, onto an amputated xenopus uh, limb, you can actually uh, regenerate because then you have these blastema cells in there that actually went de-differentiated far right. enough. So, so, I, so I guess the fundamental question there is, do we actually need to just get to a plastic state and development will take care of itself? Or in order to generate an artificial blastema, let's say, do we have to have a succession of growth factors, cytokines, et cetera, that we observe during development? And do we need to recapitulate the, this, the, the stimulation with all these various factors over time? Like we do in vitro, right? If you, if you differentiate IPS cells in vitro into any cell type, you have a whole protocol of media changes that activate or in, inhibit certain pathways, right? Um, and so the, the real question is, in vivo, does the microenvironment allow you to basically just induce plasticity and then allow the, the system to regenerate based on the microenvironment. I don't think we have the answer for that. Yeah, not necessarily. I think in, in, in the axolotl, you get morphogens grad, morph, morphogen gradients re-established, and that's how you go through the right morphogenesis uh, during regeneration. And that's the same in the, in, if we see that in the brain, we see that in the limb. So th then I don't know, um, it really depends on what you want to regenerate. Uh, if you just want to regenerate a, a part of, of a heart tissue, you, you might not need to go through a, a, a large morphogenesis uh, pro process, uh, yeah, but, but you need just the right cell types to transplant. So I, I think it really depends on, but if we want to regenerate the whole limb, we will need to undergo morphogenesis and make the, right, make the digits. Right, so, but the question is, is the capacity there to actually reestablish these morphogen gradients when you just have induced plasticity? Or yeah, enough? this, this you, is an open question. Right, exactly, <laughs> and so, so that would be really important to figure out, right? So, oh, now, okay, that was weird. Um, the, in the slides you say, can regeneration atlas would help us define this or can we use them for that? What is actually a regeneration atlas in the in vivo setting? Like for this community, people who actually measure those, you know, make those and so on, 
What are they supposed to be looking for? Should they just, you know, profile their favorite adult, uh, you know, system with adult stem cells? You kind of get something like that naturally. But are there specific conditions? Is it a model? What is it? I think ideally you would look in a specific tissue with the most relevant injury model you can have. When you're talking about adult regeneration here, not, not actually yeah. development. But, um, and, and, and that's where, of course, our models fail us, right? I mean, most of our models are, they recapitulate some part of the injury we see in, in humans, but it's usually not as, as clear. But let's say in, in the lung, people use the bleomycin model a lot to injure the, 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 the alveoli, and you end up seeing a regenerative response. And so, at the very least, getting atlases that would recapitulate and would allow us to profile over time that regenerative response is going to be very valuable, um, always with the caveat that a bleomycin injury does not recapitulate what an IPF patient experiences, right? Uh, but at the very least, it will allow us to learn about the interactions between cells as the system regenerates, uh, about the plasticity of these cells, and hopefully about lineage relationships, which are still, even though there's so much lineage tracing genetic data available in the intestine and in the lung, um, the lineage relationships are not fully determined yet. And, and I think that's where uh, multiomic analysis is going to be really powerful and it's going to help us understand this much more. I, and yeah, I, I agree. I think the lineage analysis and really directly tracking lineages would be extremely um, important and informative in that case because um, just profiling with multiomics, transcriptomics, you get the cell states, but you still you won't know which population gave rise to that state. And so tracking really the cells. And I, I think, I mean, it, it can be, of course, these all these barcoding tools that are available um, it, that, that could in the model systems be extremely informative. For us in, in, in the brain of Axolotl, it was even just very informative to use DIFSEQ, actually, that you developed, where we then could really just profile cells that divided upon excising the tissue. And, and not just profiling the whole tissue, because you will never know what was there before, what came newly, what gave rise to the new tissue. So I think this will be important for the model systems. And in humans, of course, we are very limited. We can just, I mean, in the liver, we were able to get biopsies of a regenerated liver, human liver tissue. But this is, you get that once in a while, and then you, are, you have one time point. So we will be relying on model systems and injury models. That's going, that, that is the biggest challenge, yeah. right? Accessibility to the samples. So, you know, I think we're giving, you know, not, first of all, I don't think we're giving the, the current atlases enough credit, and I do think it's going to be an interplay with the current healthy atlases, the disease atlases, and, and the model systems where we can perturb to our heart's content. And, you know, again, bringing the lung as an example in IPF, so there's, you know, Naftali Kaminsky's IPF uh, atlas, which has, you know, extreme IPF states, but, you know, at least my 50 plus year old lungs are crap and they have, you know, um, you know, you see in adults injury that you see in EPF, just fortunately not as much. So you have in just by, by sheer chance, Naftali didn't find any state in his IPF that he couldn't find in, 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 in older adults that just lived too long. And so we're gonna have the disease states, which in part recapitulate a certain type of injury. We're gonna have healthy people, older people who've had all sorts of injuries throughout their life say, serpendipitously as we grow bigger. And then we have the mouse, which we can, you know, give it bleomycin in its imperfection, but with a controlled time series, with replicates, with lineage tracing, and integrating all three of them together in a way that they inform each other. Uh, you know, another thing for lineage tracing, you know, we've been playing a little bit, and yes, there's the mitochondrial lineage tracing, which helps, but not in the time scales of injury. But we actually think that uh, lineage tracing based on methylation might actually bridge some of that. The, the, the one important distinction to make between the model systems and human patients 
especially when it comes to these chronic degenerative diseases, is that your model systems are going to be a very neat progression of states because you time the injury and then you follow it up, right? That's not what happens in patients, right? Which you is have why the how to do this comparison in an informative and valuable way is the key. You mm -hmm. know, straight up naive comparison is not going to cut it. Right. But I think you can use those multiple sources of information in a smart way to inform each yeah, other. Yeah, the smart part, that's going to be the hard one, though. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that's on us. Again, you know, we're, we're, we're behind. You guys are just too quick for us. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Um, I, I have a sort of very slightly way out question. Um, I was quite fascinated by our discussion about the axolotl and, and the regeneration. I mean, it seems to me that it's an intrinsically very useful thing to be able to do, to regenerate yourself. And yet, most um, mammalians cannot do that. Is it known? Why, we, why it's evolutionary uh, advantageous to lose regenerative potential? I have a theory, but I, I'll, <laughs> let, I'll let you. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, in that case, the axolotl is a quite special case because the axolotl limb is actually very complex and, and uh, in its architecture quite similar to, to the human limb. Uh, I mean, generally, of course, the more complex uh, tissues get, the, the less... Uh, likely they are to regenerate and the, the more complex organisms get, the less likely they are um, uh, to regenerate. And so we have, way le we have regeneration of, of partial processes of neurons in humans, whereas yeah, in, in, in other organisms you have uh, regeneration of the whole body <laughs> plan. So, uh, yeah, so I think, I mean, but there, there, this is kind of just broadly, but, but uh, I think we haven't yet fully understood. I mean, that's one of the big questions. Why can they do it and why can we not? I, I, I think it comes back to what we uh, discussed earlier about cancer and regeneration, right? Because ultimately, um, a lot of the breaks on regenerative systems that we have in mammals and in humans are driven by uh, tumor suppressor genes, ultimately, right? And so... Um, in, a, in a situation where you have to keep the soma alive until you reproduce and then evolution doesn't matter anymore, you, you probably, in, a, in, a, in an organism that has 20 years to reproduce, you want to make sure that the soma develops but then it's stable and doesn't form tumors, and so you just shut down regenerative capacity, right? It's, it's one theory, but, but it kind of makes sense, right? The other ones are clapping. So. <laughs> <laughs> Any more comments, I questions? No idea, yes, yeah. there's one. Um, so I think with, with the uh, cell atlas data that would be helpful is if we can somehow predict the strategies to make new cell types or in vivo reprogramming. Um, it's still very hard. I think it's even, correct me, I'm wrong, but like, I think it's even fit, not uh, possible to predict the Yamanaka factors for now from just based on data, like the perfect combination. So um, it's it's always hard. You can always pick up, you know, Octavore. There's like, like, but Kelfor might be difficult. So I think with the Atlas data, if we can, you know, systematically uh, uh, find or like refine or define like better reprogramming or regenerative strategies, that would be that would be good. And then the second challenge would be on the engineering part. Mm -hmm. uh, Atlas thing, it's, it's there, the technology is there, but to, to really systematically, you wanted to perturb a gene, network, uh, gene regulatory network, it's still hard. Can we you know, perturb like a thousand genes or like a hundred genes? That's still not there. Maybe small molecules can do some compo composite uh, perturbations, but I think the engineering part is also very, very hard for now. We can always, even we can predict, but we cannot really perfectly engineer it. No, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is the biggest challenge we have, right? Um, it's actually an interesting point you make, because I don't, I don't know the answer. Can, can we truly not predict the four Yamanaka factors based on a full characterization of the reprogramming 
multi-ohm, let's say? W would we not come up post hoc with, okay, these are the four factors that can do this? I, I don't know. Would be a great computational exercise. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that would be a good exercise because Cal4 is very difficult to predict. Mm -hmm. Because if you pick up, you know, gene expression, octa 4 nanog, they're so highly expressed. Mm -hmm. I'll say that our ability to predict a combination of five things that would do a desired goal just from observational data is pretty poor. Mm -hmm. Pretty poor means we just can't today, mm -hmm. but with perturbational data, I actually think our possibilities of training models that would then predict other perturbations should be there. The issue is that we have not historically collected that kind of data. That's really where the gap is. It, the assumption that you would train a model just from the observations and they get it for you, I don't know. I mean, no one has so far. Let's, let's be fair and honest with reality. But if you have perturbational data, like you try, there's way more combinations of five things to overexpress out of the genome than experiments you can do. But if you did a subset of them, would you be able then to make predictions? I think you should be in a much better shape. That's my, my feeling around it. Maybe Dana has actually an opinion on this. No, no, I don't. I mean, I'm not going to say we can't do anything with perturbations, but certainly no, without, no, no, with, with observational data alone, but observational, I mean, you know, trajectory analysis based on observations alone has picked up individual factors no, no, that I matter. Mean, a big combination, like five or six. Yeah, but I, I think that once we go to, to come, so the interesting thing is, and, and here's where, where, where we fail, because combinatorics explodes computationally, um, and because most things don't synergize, then most of our ma models also for computational efficiency and robustness and everything else are linear in their nature. And we know that biology isn't linear, but linear is just so much more um, computationally robust and easier to do and computationally efficient. But actually the combinations that really matter in biology for phenotype are anything but linear. And our ability to predict, you know, non-additive uh, um, behavior right now with observational data and our current shitty models is, is very, very poor. I think if we have a very, very, very high quality developmental atlas where we can see many of these combinatorics in play create, because in development is where you have combinatorics, you know, play the biggest, most active role, we can go a little bit further even without perturbing. Um, but again, I think to get the time resolution with all of, you know, Sarah's uh, wonderful efforts, we're going to have to go to mice because these, you know, ad hoc uh, fetuses are, are, you know, in terms of their timing and, 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 and you know, we can only go so much. But perturbations will put us in a completely different space in our understanding of combinatorics. And, and the other thing is that once you train a model like that, it doesn't mean you can only apply it in the original context. Then it might be possible that we would go back and our understanding, for example, of genome regulation will all of a sudden get to a completely different level, at which point you could go back to observational data from many other systems and make fantastic predictions. This is all hypothetical because no one has done any of this. But for the, but what for, but for what you can do with combinations now in rich phenotyping, I think we're doing the work that would tell us whether we can be successful. That's roughly where things are. So which, which could still mean, ah, too bad, biology is still harder, we didn't figure it out, but it's worthwhile trying. So, so I, I, to summarize here, I guess a common theme of the session is that we would like to do a lot of things in human cells, but we do absolutely still need model systems in order to gain more information, in order to gain predictive power, uh, because we need to do these perturbations and we need to understand how regeneration actually occurs, which we cannot sample in humans at, at the detail that we need for, for understanding, right? Yes, and I, I think uh, in the human context that it, it is definitely very valuable to have organoids from one lineage, multi-lineage, and going towards perturbations to really be at some point predictive uh, about uh, the response or, or what factors are needed and so on to, to regenerate. Again, you know, the organoids, but also other in vivo model systems because, you know, from my experience, even if my goal was, you know, to interpret 
the, the observational, messy human data that I get from the clinic, the power of collecting, you know, some mouse gem data in order to help me interpret a, that human data is, you know, cannot be uh, yes. overstated. We need all of it. <laughs> all right. I think we're at time, actually. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming and for a great discussion. Thank <laughs> you.